All right. It's it's live now. Right. All right, good. Good, good. All right, so, no so wait, no wait. Hold up. Yeah, let me I gotta put the page. If you want to, you can go in uh in the comment box and put all your uh your information. Put all your information and stuff in there before we start. Okay. <clears throat> good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. This is 12 Faces of Sober Speaks podcast, episode nine. I am your host, Kenneth L. Watson Jr. And uh, like I said, this is my very, very first male guest. And I'm definitely looking forward to uh, interviewing this brother. Please forgive me up for the technical difficulties. You know, I'm always still trying to learn all this tech savvy stuff. You know, this guy is getting kind of old. But like I said, you can go ahead and go on 12 Faces of Sober. That's 12facesofsober.com. You can get the book right here. Like I said, this is the most recent one with the updated, uh, with the updated title on the back. Um, you can also get the shirt that I'm wearing right here on 12 Faces of Sober. I actually added some new merchandise this past week. Um, I have net gaiters on there. I also have a cup of coffee mugs. I have uh, some stickers on there, and I would say that would be it as far as for right now. But all that stuff is in uh, in a variety of colors. Once again, that's on 12facesofsober.com. You could also get my book on Amazon. All you got to do is type in Amazon. I'm sorry, not type in Amazon. Type in 12 Faces of Sober, and like I said, my face should pop up. You can get the ebook version as well as you can get the, um, the paperback version. Amazon's pretty good with it. They ship out pretty fast, and uh, that's pretty much it. But now, my host. Now, I'm gonna give you a. Uh, I'm sorry, my guest. I'm gonna give you a little backstory on on uh, how how I met this uh, this young brother. Um, it was 2017 at uh, St. Cloud State uh, University, and I went back into uh, pretty much one of the old one of the first rooms that we uh, had the Council of African-American Students, at least when I came as a student in 2001. Now, like I said, it's 2017. And I was actually working on a project and I needed some help. And I wanted to have somebody that, you know, that has a kind of the same mindset as uh, myself, that's hungry, that's, uh, that's determined, that's willing to learn something new and uh, not afraid to uh, try new things. And, um, I stood in front of the group, introduced myself, uh, let the students know that I was an alumni and uh, I'm back and, uh, you know, just trying to get my master's degree. And I uh, said I needed someone to, to help with some video editing. And he was sitting uh, pretty, pretty much to my left. And as soon as I announced it, he, his hand went up before I could pretty much even finish the sentence. And um, we've been really cool ever since. Uh, he worked on my, uh, like I said, um, the project that I had uh, needed help on, which was my South Africa uh, project. And uh, we, we have that in common. We both did the study abroad in South Africa. And um, he also did another study abroad. So we kind of got that in common as well. He did one in uh, Laos and Thailand, and um, I did one in uh, Mexico. And uh, also, um, he was uh, involved in another project that I did. Um, I think it was one of my last projects before I finished my master's program. So um, that was pretty good because I had the opportunity to, uh, he, he uh, self wrote, directed, produced, starred in his own play at uh, St. Cloud State. And um, I had the luxury of uh, taking pictures of that, documenting uh, a lot of that, uh, of that uh, performance. And then, like I said, we, we put it to uh, a mini project as far as uh, for one of my classes. And so I'm not gonna talk no more. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce this uh, multi-talented uh, young king and, uh, you know, go ahead and give us a backstory. You know, where are you from? Uh, what the, uh, when did you go to St. Cloud State? Um, and where are you at today? Word. Well, appreciate that intro, man. It made me feel real special, you know. Uh, so for those who don't know, my name is Anthony Alexander Samuel Horde. Um, I went to St. Cloud from 2012 to 2018. Um, I graduated with a degree in uh, theater. And yeah, like on campus, I was invo involved with a lot of different organizations. Um, I even uh, started my own organization, St. Cloud Urban Entertainment. 
And now I currently live in Los Angeles, California, pursuing a career in the industry, whether it be acting or in music. So that's what's up. You know, and, and like I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we do have a, a lot of similarities because, you know, I had a dream of uh, actually taking that chance and going to L.A. And, you know, without going through names, let's just say I had somebody that was in the industry. And this is when I was living in Phoenix in 2005. So I'm two years out of, uh, out of college. And I was, I was afraid to go because of the lifestyle that I saw in LA during that time, which was that white stuff, you know, that cocaine and that fast life. And just from visiting when I lived in San Diego, going up there during spring break, I just wasn't really ready for that. But I do want to salute you and say that I'm definitely proud of the fact that you took a chance and you're in LA. And so why don't you share with everybody exactly, you know, some of the things that you are involved in out there in LA. Definitely, definitely. Um, so everything that I do in LA is, there's multiple things I do, but the things that I do to sustain myself, at least, I uh, am a background actor on TV shows and music videos. Um, I also, actively find gigs, whether it be acting or uh, PA work or just basically creative stuff in general. And I do every bit of creative things that I can, you know, find passion in. So uh, yeah, like those are the things that I do to sustain myself. Everything else that I do is totally creative and just like what I think is gonna progress me in my journey to, you know, being successful, so. And, um... I, I noticed that you had a music video, so uh, you, so let's talk about yeah. that real quick before we get into the to the the writ, the, the knit and grit of the uh, the topic today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that music video was actually a feature for me. I was uh, featured on a, a song with one of the homegirls. She hit me up. She said that she felt passionate about everything that was going on. She wanted somebody to. Uh, you know, she wanted to just do a collaboration with uh, many talented black artists to get a message across. You know, like you said before, like I'm eager to help and I'm eager to be a part of just things in general that I think is gonna be progressive. So I hopped on um, the opportunity right away. So uh, the name of the song is called Freedom, featuring Dolo Deuce Duke and it's by Diana uh, Sade. I don't know, I don't know if her last name is a part of her artist name, but um, yeah, like, it was a good opportunity to just be a part of it. We shot it right here on, um, just off of uh, Melrose okay. out here in Los Angeles, California, um, or at least my specific scene. And yeah, it, I was happy to be a part of that. I was definitely happy to be a part of that. That's just so, you, you said Melrose, I remember uh, my partner, he used to live like right off of Melrose around the corner. It was like yep, some kid did or something like that. So moving lived, that I lived off of Melrose so far. I lived yeah, when I was in East Hollywood. I lived off of Melrose. I lived in uh, Burbank um, when I first moved here. I moved with my auntie. I was in Burbank, and uh, I live in Silver Lake right now. This is probably the best place I've ever lived. It's kind of tucked away in the hills. It's kind of nice, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, now uh, there's been a lot of uh, events that's going on. Uh, you know, as of late, um, there was uh, some of the some decisions that were made uh, just this past week. Uh, we got uh, we got we got some uh, well, one verdict that was made this past week in regards to the uh, to the George Floyd. So what I want to do is I want to uh, let's go back last year. Let's go back to to where it all started. So. When when you when was the first time you actually saw? It? Did you see the the George Floyd as it was happening, or was it something that you caught uh, a little bit later? I pop, I probably I like to say that I caught it about an hour later. Um, obviously, it being in Minneapolis, so many so so many uh, things that I'm looking on social media is the footage. And like about an hour or so after, I'm like just kind of laying in my bed, peeping what's going on. There wasn't really much else to do because we were like heavy in quarantine. Um, so I had 
just so much time to just inform myself on what happened, but it wasn't that hard because it was everywhere on social media. Um, so yeah, I was just in my bed, just kind of casually minding my own business. And I think, uh, I think Chucky was the person that I saw post about it first. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just kind of viewing it. It's like, Oh, what's going on? Realized it was about like a, a 12 minute video and this guy laying on the ground, police on his neck, you know, and I just kind of viewed it. I'm like, wow. Okay. You know, um, just kind of numb to it. Uh, I didn't have like a instant reaction of like sadness. Uh, my instant reactions are usually anger, but I think in that instance, my, my reaction was, but of course, and I think that was the saddest thing about it. It's just like, of course this is happening, you know? So. Right. And, and so when, you know, were you a part of any protests out there in LA? Yeah. Um, I went to a few protests. Um, yeah, because they, they got to protest in kind of fast out here. I was kind of surprised. But then again, this is LA. This is my first time being involved in like, uh, you know, this killing stuff has been happening by the police for a long time. This is my first time being out in LA while it happened. Um, also around the time that Breonna Taylor and uh, Aubrey Graham, uh, all these different people around, it was all around the same time. So I think people were just fed up. I was definitely a part of the protest, definitely. Okay. And, and you know, and the, the, I, I want to share this story before we actually go on. Um, and, and we're going we're gonna to touch on this topic as well. You yeah. know, I've had uh, plenty of experiences with the police and, and in cities like San Diego, Phoenix, Arizona, El Paso, Texas, St. Paul, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, St. Cloud, you know, and being that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older and, you know, some of these things were, you know, going on with me in the late 90s, early 2000s. And here it is, it's 2021 in 2020 and some of these same uh things are happening if not worse the only difference is is that it's being captured on multiple cameras if it's a body cam or if it's multiple people holding phones and and that's the the essence and i guess you can say the the good thing about it is that you have you know the the capabilities of doing that is recording regardless of what ends up being the outcome is that we didn't have this. It was like, luckily, like I said, give an example, Rodney King, it was it was the helicopter cop that was recorded. So if that helicopter cop wouldn't have recorded it, the country and the world would have never seen that video of Rodney King being beat that way. So I guess my question is, is um, so when, did you, did you actually get a chance to view the trial itself um, that, that was going on? Or were you, you know, occupied with other things <laughs> out there in LA? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that I didn't necessarily want to follow the trial. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wouldn't say I was like occupied, like in a way of like a distraction. I think I didn't want to follow it because I assumed what the outcome would be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of what we're trying to, a lot of what I'm trying to do, or a lot of what I think people are trying to do or at least should try to do is protect their spirit like i don't know yeah protect their spirit i think that's the best way to put it um i, I made an ugly assumption that the verdict was gonna be uh uh that he got off he was innocent he was uh in the rightful lines of the law to do exactly what he did and like i was just preparing myself not to get angry you know what i'm saying um uh, and i think that was a lot of what i was dealing with I think as the reaction to the video, um, so I did go to protest, but I didn't go to the first protest. You know, I sat on it, I waited, I let all of my friends get angrier than I did to a point where I couldn't ignore it. Of course I was already angry, but I was holding it in. Um, but like activism, going to protests, going to rallies, it can be a lot if you don't know how to mentally prepare yourself for exactly what you're about to transpire in, you know, like, I don't go to the rallies and the protests for happy time, you know, like I'm going mostly to mourn, but 
uh, also to invoke change as much as I can in a protest. So like, it's a lot. So after I got worn out of the protest, after I got worn out of the angry friends telling me that I needed to be more angry, all of that stuff, I didn't have a lot of energy to like really watch the trial. So every bit of the trial that I was catching was afterwards. So, okay. and, then and that's you, just me. And then now, now, you know, you've obviously seen, you know, videos from the past in terms of like the different protests from the 60s, you know, uh, the riots in the 60s to protests in, in the 90s. Um, now, now, you know that you're a part of history, right? Now, you know, it at some point, like when, when they, you know, in 20, 30 years, you can honestly say, hey, I was there. I was, you know, how, how, and I guess how, how would that, how, how does that, you know, sit in your soul right now, knowing that, you know, some of these things that you've been, you know, you've been a part of, you're a part of history. I mean, it's big in the idea that, you know, it's a beautiful thing to be able to talk to somebody from the 60s or somebody from uh, the late 50s, talk about their experiences with activism. I think it's a good learning opportunity. Um, and I think we need to cherish those moments where people could say, yeah, I was a part of history. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand in the situation that we are in now, I'm gonna be one of those people to a future generation like, yeah, I was a part of this bit of history. This is what I did. This is what I thought was right. This is what I decided to fight for. Um, but personally, man, I'm tired of historic moments, man. Like historic moments are happening left and right and all for the wrong reasons. And the very last thing that I ever wanted was to continue fighting the same fight, you know, and feeling like the bar isn't being moved. Even though it is, like I said, like you said, um, the verdict, he was guilty on all three charges. This is definitely progress. We probably wouldn't have seen anything like that in the 60s. Um, so I got to remind myself of the bits of progress that we make. But at the same time, it's like I could, I could do without the historic moments surrounding killing Black people. I want to do another historic moment like, you know, the first uh, multi-billionaire, Black multi-billionaire, I'm sorry. Um, the first, you know, female Black president or the first, you know, I want to be a part of some more history than just Black people being killed. But it's a surreal thing to be like, yo, like this is seriously going to get in some textbooks. This is seriously like big, huge. It was the the biggest civil rights movement of all time, or at least in a recorded American history. So like, yeah, it's, it's, it's surreal. You know, I look at it like, you know, this is a lot. This is a lot. So, yeah, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, to, I mean, I feel you. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not taking, I'm not taking away from that because in terms of even like for myself, like I, like it, you, you want to be on the right side of history, needless to Absolutely. say. And it's, it's, it is sad that as, you know, blacks, that we seem to continue to get the same type of treatments, the same type of things keep happening to us on a, on, as, at a rapid pace compared to other nationalities. And, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. Like, and I'm gonna give you an example so that we can have a talk about this, but I had somebody that I went to, um, actually it was elementary school with, and they, they're Hispanic and they made a comment more or less like, you know, all lives should matter. And then he brought up a, a situation about a soldier. Um, it was, I think it was Vanessa Guillen who uh, was killed out, um, was I think murdered in uh, Fort Hood, Texas. So I had to let them know, like, but it, the, the George Floyd thing wasn't, it's not just for African-Americans. This is something that has been going on with, you know, a lot of people of color. It just seems to happen more to black people. So that situation has nothing to do with police brutality. That was a murder. This is police brutality. So I hit them with this. I said, where was that same energy? When I was in elementary school, one of the only blacks at the school, and y'all was calling me the N-word. I said, yeah, I'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So now if you want to change the subject on something, let me give you an example, too, to open your eyes. And, I mean, I guess it's just, it, it's, it's, 
it's hard because, you know, I'm tired of seeing it. Like, I mean, I can remember um, it was, it was, uh, what happened? It was the, in Ferguson. I remember yes. I was in, I was in, uh, I give you exactly when it was. It was um, late August of 2014. The reason why I know this is because I watched that when I was in treatment. I w- it was one of the first. It was one of the first days I was in treatment um, out here in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, mm-hmm. and here it is. I'm seeing this as I'm going into a hospital, like, and I'm stuck here, and like I couldn't, you know, didn't really know what was going on. But all I know is that Ferguson was getting, you know, all hell broke loose out in Ferguson. So I mean, it's it is sad. I'm I'm tired of seeing it because, like I said, I'm 41, and this has been going on as long as I can remember. You know what I'm saying, and yeah. it, it 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 needs to be stopped. But like, man, it's like you said, the little progress is better than none. I say it like that. That's a but, fact. Um, so uh, during, like I said, uh, during that trial, we had uh, another incident in Minnesota that um, brother uh, Dante Wright lost his life in uh, a traffic uh, traffic stop. But before we go into that, I'm going to give you another example as far as uh, a situation where it could have went left. I was in San Diego. It was uh, 1998, I believe. It was myself, uh, my nephew, Michael, uh, my best friend, Anthony Lyons. Brandon, Ger- uh, Brandon Gamble was there, um, and I believe one other person. We were just leaving um, playing uh, at Open Gym on our way uh, to drop somebody off. And I hit a left and got stopped by the police. The very first thing they said to me was, you have an air freshener hanging from your window. You can't have it. I said, all right. So, you know, all everybody in the car is just nervous, whatever. And uh, my buddy Anthony, he was sitting on the right side. I had a, a, a 85 uh, Cherry Must, uh, Mustang, Ford Mustang. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, the um, officer, his, his partner, walked up on the passenger side. The whole entire time he's holding his gun. So my buddy was like, man, he, he's telling me to put my hands on my man. Just listen to him. We, you know, we're not doing nothing. We good. So the cop walks away, takes my license and insurance, walks to the car, comes back, however long it was. Then he comes back and says, you guys fit the description of a robbery that just happened. So <laughs> we're like soaking wet from playing basketball, got on basketball clothes, and, and literally, the, it barely, like, it barely was like daybreak in between, you know, sunset and getting ready to get dark. Yeah. And, we, you know, I told the officer, I said, man, I'm sorry, but I'm, we, we weren't a part of that. But, you know, but, and of course he let us go. But just imagine how that could have went if somebody in that car could have said something, somebody yeah. in the back seat moved wrong, and things of that such. But I wanted to bring that up to you because I saw it. You know, and I was shocked and floored. But so what 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 was your take on that? And hello, Rose. Uh Rose said hello. Hey Rose, how you doing? Yeah, she said what's up. Word. So like so that's a um let me just break down everything. So like sure. um uh, from everything that goes on throughout what black people basically experience throughout life. I think it's crazy how uh, one of the things that I've always been able to have with, like, when it comes to having conversations with Black people, we all have stories about how the police could have changed our lives forever. I've never had, a well, okay, let me not say that. I've never had a Black person that I've gotten close with that I couldn't have that conversation with. You know, mm-hmm. there have probably been some black people that claimed it never happened or they just didn't want to talk about it at the time, but I didn't get a chance to really know them. But every black person that I know has a story that, you know, they had an interaction with the police that could have went totally left if this, that, and the third would have happened. And it's just kind of sad. I don't know if that's a thing for everybody else. It probably is. More than likely not, you know, just from the things that I've seen in the past. Um, we've seen how police react not saying police don't kill people in other races but it takes a lot you know a white man can stand in front of a you know a police officer with a loaded gun talking however crazy he wants to 
and you know, it's 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 nothing. He's not gonna do anything or they no, don't you don't feel pose a threat. Threatened. Yeah, they don't, you don't pose a threat. Yeah, that's true. But you know, I guess Dante Dante Wright was enough for them to feel threatened or enough for them to so just to get into that side of it, because I'm kind of rambling. No, um, from what I seen, that entire interaction was total BS. I don't think that any point in time an officer is being trained that they would ever make make the mistake of mistaking their taser for their gun. Um and I think the effort that they go to train officers to be aggressive towards black people or in certain neighborhoods is absolutely BS because things like this happen. Mm -hmm. He was stereotyped more or less, it seems like. And I think he threatened them to a point where they didn't care what they were grabbing for. She mm -hmm. probably was in an honest panic, but that can't be an excuse. And I do think that in that situation, she she should still be able to determine a taser from a pistol. Um, and one of the things that really throw me off about the video is that when she attempted to pull her taser and she was attempting to activate her taser, she was screaming, taser, taser, taser. Now, I don't know how many times it was recorded when police are using their taser, but never have I ever heard that a police officer is saying the words taser while attempting to operate a taser. It seemed like she was trying to cover up the fact that she already decided to use her gun. Mm. So she wanted to say taser in order for it to hold up in court. But that can go on to conspiracy theory territory, so I don't want to entertain it that much. Right. But that was the first thing that I picked up on while really digging into that video. I wouldn't be shooting somebody saying taser, 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 because it sounds like I'm already trying to justify a decision. So Right. Yeah, because um, go ahead. I was gonna just add, <clears throat> add to yeah. that. Is a you know, you being in the military, I've handled various weapons and so so on and so forth. But a handgun, a, a loaded nine millimeter, you know, most of these officers carry whatever is heavy with bullets a taser is much 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 lighter and so yeah i i would have to agree with you on that of making that call as if like she already knew in her mind like this is what i'm going to do because you know what you have to understand is that their tr the officers are trained not to have their their you know your gun is supposed to be on on safety at all times so you still got to hit that, you know, take it off of safety in order to fire it. And uh, doing a taser and hitting an unlock on a, uh, on a nine millimeter or on a pistol, period, is two different things. So, but go ahead. Yeah. I mean, well. Well, so, and then, you, so I'm glad you brought up that you was in the military. If an incident like that, say that you were maybe running a domestic thing overseas where you had to apprehend somebody, right? Mm-hmm. If you were to use that excuse, do you think that you would have a fighting chance in court? No, like you're gonna be, you're gonna get punished. Cause uh, me and me and a buddy of mine was just having a conversation. He he's been deployed a couple times. We were literally having this conversation, I believe, Friday. And that it's I don't it's like a um, I don't know the exact words, but it's more or less of a humanitarian thing. So if you torture or something like that. You can be court-martialed here in the uh, in America. That is true. I, I'm not going to quote the actual regulation for it, but yes, that is true. So yeah, but, you can be yeah. held accountable for your actions overseas. Yes, it's ridiculous. Then, um, you know, military personnel, more or less people we expect to be over aggressive when it comes to situations, are usually more trained calm and collected than the police officers were supposed to trust to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. It's a disgusting truth, man. Um, and I know a lot of people are afraid of this change, but there has to be something that has changed about how we train our police officers in America, um, especially with the way they treat different races. Um, there shouldn't be such things as like red zones or 
you know, stop and frisk zones or areas where they can intentionally be more aggressive and try to meet quotas because it just targets a certain demographic of people because, you know, we still live in segregated ways. So it's mm. an easy way to like push racist agendas. And it's, it's crazy, you know, like, yeah, it's crazy. The, 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 the crazy part about it is, is that, that the, these laws are, have been written and they can actually get away with it, you know, by, you know, writing certain things that a lot of people are not going to understand. And, and, and that's, that's the issue and problem is that, you know, you know, you have states where it's, you know, dominated by one political party. And if they, if they run it, then they gonna try to make sure that their agenda is going to be continued. But like I said, hopefully they can get that stuff uh, fixed in Georgia. Cause that, that ain't, is is sad that, you know, you can make a shift in politics or not possible, but um, as far as an election, and now they want to change all these different rules off of that, off the voting and stuff. So, but yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 hard right now, man. And and like I said, I I, I do I do agree that there there definitely needs to be uh, a lot a lot of changes within the police department as a whole, especially now that um, you know the Minneapolis police has been on watch or now is under investigation by uh, the Department of Justice. And so now it's going to be um, exposed as far as a lot of stuff, not just for Chauvin. It's going to be a lot of those officers are going to, you know, they're going to have to, they're going to have to do something. And in Minneapolis might be that first place to, to really see a dramatic change. Because like I said, Minneapolis basically put the world on notice. Like, yeah, it's sad to say, it, but I mean, and I, I, I applaud Minneapolis for that because you know, all the, the um, you know, community activists that they, they, they got together and did that because if it, if it wasn't for those type of organizers, man, and the people showing up, it would just be another, another person that just died and, and we forget about it. But Minneapolis wasn't planned. So shout out to Minneapolis for so that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's crazy because um, I think one of the, I guess it's it's a sad truth, but it is a truth. Minneapolis is a lot more known because of the activism and the people who've died and got killed in Minneapolis than anything else. Um, I don't think there's any other one place or one state, at least I should say, that's had three major killings. And, you know, Minnesota is that area, Minneapolis in particular, but, um, you know, Philando Castile was killed in St. Paul, if I'm not mistaken. And then, you know, we know it's the Twin Cities. It goes hand in hand. So they basically treat it like the same place. Right. So, like, yeah, you know, like, it happens everywhere. I'm sure this sort of thing is happening in Los Angeles right now. But mm -hmm. Los Angeles is Los Angeles. You know, LAPD is LAPD. They're going to be known for whatever they're known for. And if it gets caught on camera, it may blow up, it may not. But this place is so rich in the corruption that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Minnesota is small enough to where we can do something about it. I mm -hmm. think we're uh, tech savvy enough and have enough in the history of activism to like actually make movements behind it. So yeah, definitely shout out to all of the organizers, all of the uh, true frontline activists, the people who are willing to put their lives on the line to like push out the word. They, they have been doing an excellent job. It's sad that people are acknowledging the power that Minnesota has from these incidents, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, that, that <laughs> and like I said, you know, in, 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 go, ahead. go I've ahead. Had, I've had people tell me, <laughs> I've had people tell me that they didn't even know black people were in Minnesota before all of this stuff started happening. So like. Now, now look. Hey, when when I moved there in two thousand, they said the same thing to me. It was like we didn't yeah. know black people. I'm like, y'all, you might want to go to the north side, but might want to go to the south side. I mean, it's plenty. It's plenty. You Absolutely. Know, so, yeah, and you know, but like I said, man, it's you know that's one thing I, I definitely can can say that I liked about Minnesota, and, and just you know, in that in this short duration of time, especially since I've been back to to see collectively what what you know people like yourself and others have been able to do to like, you know, bring awareness. I mean, I, I know some people, big shots out to Chantal. 
Um, she's a heavy hitter within uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff out in um, well, in St. Paul, but she's everywhere. And then Raisha Williams um, as well. Um, and 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 these these people is like every single time something going on within the community, they're out there. And I just want to say salute to them because, like I said, you know these or you know some of these organizers in other cities get bad raps. But those two don't. I, I've known uh, Chantal since like I worked in radio in like '04, so she she definitely is a good person. But you know, it's it's I guess for now it's just more or less like we yeah we can rally together. That that's that's fine and dandy. But you know, until that there is some dramatic change, I mean, we can have a thousand and one protests. We can, you know, people can go out and and loot and right and everything else that the mainstream media wants to call a group of people of color just getting together walking and, and protesting some issues but what 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 do you think what what's more or less the you see the future for minnesota and, and and some of these events like this going on like how for one to be handled for two like you know like i guess you could say because i don't want to put another r.i.p on another t-shirt you know what I'm saying? Or somebody else's face. Like, I mean, when can it be enough? You know what I'm saying? What is it truly going to take to be for it to, to really uh, stop? I mean, so the best thing we can do is change minds. Um, there is no one way to do that. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are coming, coming to the realization that they don't want to take on that responsibility of changing people's minds about stuff they should already know. Mm -hmm. um it's a hard thing to do um to tell people like hey you know the police treat me differently than you whatever race you are they treat me differently people might go through the denial stage they don't believe it people might believe it but don't want to change it because they're okay with their benefits or they might be actively against us so they really want to keep the system in order no matter what status an individual is in i think the most important thing for black people is to stay focused. Um, I think it is necessary for everybody, really, not just black people, to partake in some form of activism, whether it be protesting, uh, writing letters, um, I don't know, like uh, getting things in place to change, like laws or becoming a politician. It's a harder thing to ask than to actually do, or a harder thing to do than to actually ask, but. Uh, Along with uh, being a part of the activism, I think that we should still maintain the things that we have going forward. Mm. Black people have so many things going for them, especially right now more than ever. And I think these things, I don't wanna use the word distraction, but we tend to put aside, that the th put aside the things that we wanna work towards in order to protest. And I think that was one of the initial thoughts that I had when I first went to a George Floyd protest is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting into the emotion of it all. I'm sad. I'm angry. A police officer better not say the wrong thing to me. I might, I might go slick at the tongue, all of this stuff. And I found myself not doing any art, not progressing in my career, not, you know, of course, you know, it's because it's, quarantine and all of this stuff there's a lot of things that's happened at that time that's contributing to this like self-deprecating mood that i'm in mm -hmm. but a lot of what contributed to it was the fact that i feel like i have to fight so much and i think that what i want to see for the future of minneapolis and black people in general is that we find a balance of fighting for change and still staying focused on what we got going on um now more than ever black people are are financially off more than ever black people are getting into more stocks than ever black people are opening more businesses and being more mindful of financial literacy um there's a lot of people who are having spiritual awakenings and all of this stuff but are able to find balance in like religion and everything that is uh basically contributing to making black people as great as we are in 2021 and I don't want to lose focus of that because they 
keep trying to, I don't want to use the word distraction, but it's the best word that's coming to my mind right now. I just don't want us to be deterred from the greatness that we're heading towards. Right. So that's the, right. that's the future I want to see for Minneapolis is that we continue to fight, but we also don't stop in the things that we can achieve. I like that. I like that. And um, we 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 gonna take a uh, take a shift real quick before we uh, close out this uh, this interview. So um, so I was told by uh, a little source that uh, you you uh, are in what year of sobriety? <laughs> uh, I've been so. I've never been a smoker. I've never smoked any reefer cannabis or weed at all at any point in my life. And I've been sober since freshman year of college. So that's about eight years, going on nine years now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you got somebody that's been long, <laughs> been sober longer than me. So yeah. uh, salute, salute to this young brother. I wish I had known that early in the game. We definitely could have been talking a whole lot more when I was out in St. Cloud. But um, yeah, that that um when when I was told that, I was like, wow. I was like, dang, like that's that's what's up, you know. So I uh wanna, you know, really commend you on that, man. You said Thank nine you. you said nine years? Going on nine going years. On so eight years going on nine years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's a long time and that's that's definitely a goal that I'm looking forward to. And um I'm sure Rose is right behind me on that one too. But um, Absolutely. you know, I you know, I, I just wanted to just ask you one simple question. Was that by choice that you chose like to just stop drinking, like it just wasn't for you, or you know, was it something that you was just like one thing was like, okay, because you know you college students, like you said, you got that, you know one bad party or something like that. It could have changed yeah. your mind. It could have been anything. All right. Well, yeah. Um, I'm going to start with the smoking part of it. Uh, so pretty much like every black family, the 80s was really bad on my family drug-wise um, as far as distribution and consuming. I don't want to get into it too much, but I think I just didn't want to contribute to it at all. And I got early comparisons to like some of the worst people in my, well, not the worst people in my family, but to the people in my family who were substance abusers. They said mm -hmm. that you act just like them, you might grow up to be just like them. Mm -hmm. And I'm very hard headed. You know, there's times that people in my family told me, oh, one day you're gonna smoke. And I would tell them, no, I'm not gonna smoke. Um, and they'd be like, trust me, I've been in your shoes. Mm -hmm. You're 15 right now, you're young, you don't know what you're talking about. One day you're gonna smoke. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I think we should, first of all, change about families or the black family dynamic is pushing curses. You know what I'm saying? Pushing the idea that the family is still going to be down here because we've made these comparisons to these other people in the family. I think that's wrong and I think that's toxic. Um, but I think one of the things I picked up from that message is like, how dare you tell me that I'm going to smoke? Now, because of that, I'm not going to smoke anything. There's right. not going to be a single person that's going to force me to smoke anything. Nobody has ever attempted to beat me up because I passed the joint. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I don't know. It, it's just one of those things that I honestly think I don't smoke because I'm hard headed enough mm. to not smoke. Um, drinking, like you said, it was, a, um, it was actually an incident where a party went left. Um, and somebody sober just needed to be on the scene, but none of us was sober. Um, you can't perform CPR intoxicated, and we can't drive because, you know, we're all intoxicated. And there was somebody's life that was possibly on the line. Um, and without getting into too many details, because we both went to St. Cloud, I don't want to say names, okay. but me and my friends were at a party one of our female friends were drugged and she had a seizure. Mm. We couldn't do anything about it because all of us were intoxicated. We mm. couldn't run to get our inhaler because, you know, we're off campus. We were 
We were past fifth Av. Mm -hmm. Um, so her inhaler is in her dorm. We need a car. Uh, nobody can perform CPR. We will be breathing alcohol down her throat. All these things. The person that I'm talking about made it through, but it was such a traumatic moment that me and my homeboys just decided from that point on we would never drink. Um, so I'm just sticking to my word. As far as I know, the other homeboy that I'm in uh, cahoots with and not drinking, he's holding to his word. We haven't taken a drink since that day. So, Dang, that's see. Now that right there is is true motivation. You know what I'm saying? It it can take something life changing as such to say you no longer want to. But for me, it took a little bit longer. But I do like and the fact okay. that I am. Yeah, and and I and I embrace it. Like I'm, you know, like I said, even when I stopped, you know, finally drinking, I think I was 30, 36, 36 going on thirty seven somewhere around there. Mm. And, it was, and a lot of people didn't believe me because of the fact that I drank so much. But I was like, nah, I, you know, it's a new lifestyle. But I love it though. I, I, I really and truly do. It and looks um, good on you. Thank you, man. Thank you, know? you bro. I, I really do appreciate it for real, man. Like, just from when I met you till now, man, it, life is definitely different. You know what I mean? But I'm just glad that you and I, you know, I, like I told you, you know, I, I'm the kind of person. Like if I if I'm cool with you, you'll know. You know what I'm saying? And from time to time I reach out to you, see how you're doing, you know what I'm saying? You hit me up. And, and that's what it's all about. I'm happy to to give back to the students of St. Cloud State that came after me. You know what I'm saying? Because there there wasn't too many that was that did that for us. And there was only one person, and that was uh Shannon Williamson. And uh I still talk to her to this day. And she was a grad student when I came in as an undergrad. So I mean it's 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 amazing, man. I, I I'm I'm really and truly glad. I'm I'm thankful and, and really happy at the fact that you are my first male uh, guest because, you know, I, I I said it before that I wanted to kind of take a shift in terms of the conversation. It's nothing against my queens. It's just the fact that I need more of these type of content. You know what I'm saying? So I I really do appreciate. Um. So how how can uh you know people follow you? And uh, yo, you know, throw your your social media handle in the comment box. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll be sure to do that. But um, and then yeah, you forgot to uh, to mention when when this movie coming out. That, <laughs> that, oh, you can't say nothing yet, right? You can't mention it yet. I can't say too much, man. Okay, um, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, my bad. I mean, I want to be a spoiler alert on that. Just like if so, I'm gonna give people my social media. And okay. if they choose to follow me, they can follow the progress in my career. Um, okay. But yeah, I recently got a speaking role on a feature film that's going to be coming to uh, streaming platforms, all stream, not all streaming platforms, but like Amazon and stuff like that. So, okay. um, yeah. Y'all get a, 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 a photographic memory of <laughs> Mr. Anthony Horst's face because I'm sure this, this will not be his last speaking role in the movie. I, I can guarantee Absolutely that. Absolutely not. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm speaking leader, a, a lead role, lead role sooner than later, you know. But like right I said, on, right man, I, I appreciate you uh, taking a time out your uh, Sunday uh, to be a part of uh, 12 Faces Over Speaks podcast. You just don't understand how much this means to me that, um, that we can sit here and have a conversation. Two, two kings from two different uh, decades and having the same uh, interest in a lot of different ways. They're still trying to help and encourage others, and especially our black brothers, to you know not not give up the fight, and 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 just be be more mindful and aware, and and, and don't get into nothing that you ain't supposed to. Because in a lot of ways, this is what some police are looking for. You know, they, they 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 know they they can smell out the trouble over somebody that's doing good, but they can you know find that person doing good and get them into trouble as well. Absolutely. But, uh, I'm honored before, to be the first one, man. Okay. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. I, you know, like I, like I told you, uh, four years ago, I said, we, we, we gonna continue to work. And, and like I said, Hey, I, I, I hold true to that. You know what I mean? But, uh, again, um, continue doing what you do, man. I am definitely proud of you. You know, I, I'm saying it on the record, but you already know, 
Um, I look forward to uh, continue seeing uh, you live your live out my dream in L.A. and some. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot not of too people, late for you. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no. Nah, right, hey, hey, you know, you, hey, you never know. Hey, scoop me up on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. But uh, like I said, you know, like I said, keep in touch. You know what I mean? You know how to reach me. You got my number directly. So um, I'm going to close it with this. Um, 12 Faces Sober Speak podcast episode number nine is coming to a close. Uh, once again, thank you to my guest, first male guest, Anthony Hoare, very talented brother. He is um, a very, very knowledgeable dude. And like I said, if you if you need some insights, some tips on, you know, how to how to make it in L.A., he got he got the blueprint. He definitely got the blueprint. I got some tips. Yeah, and uh, like I said, you guys can log on to 12facesofsober.com. You can get all the merch. You can get the book. Like I said, the book is still out there. You know what I'm saying? Support me. And like I said, y'all be blessed. Look forward to the next guest. I got another mail coming up. More uh, more information on that dude uh, coming next week. Y'all be blessed and have a good night. Peace.